Do you ever find yourself searching for something bigger than you? For a community to be a part of? A place founded on truth and love. A place to worship the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, and the Son of God. Welcome to Founded in Truth, where we're more than just a fellowship. We're a family, so welcome home. All right, well, God bless you guys. Thank you for uh, being here. I have just a simple message planned for today. We're going to be going through John chapter four, um, the story about the Samaritan woman and Yeshua's encounter with her. But before we get there, I actually wanted to talk about 2 Corinthians 5 because I believe it kind of ties in to what we're gonna be talking about today. So this passage in 2 Corinthians 5 is where Paul talks about how Yeshua's resurrection and his ascension has inaugurated a new creation. And in this new creation, the image and the glory of God that was partly lost in Adam is being restored through the Messiah and through his body, the church, us, Jews and Gentiles coming together with Yeshua the Messiah as the head of the body. And we have an active role in bringing about this restoration, this new creation. And this is essential, I think, to who we are. This is essential doctrine. It's essential and fundamental to our purpose and our identity as believers in Messiah. And I'm not gonna go through the whole passage. We have a lot of scripture to get through today, but I just wanna point out a couple of things regarding what this mission entails. Verse 16 of 2 Corinthians 5 says that we are to regard no one according to the flesh. Walking out this new creation is to regard no one according to the flesh. That is, we regard no one from a human or worldly point of view. That is to say, we do not base anyone's worth or their value on the values of our fallen world. This world, uh, the world determines a person's value on the basis of their race, on the basis of their social status, on the basis of their political allegiances, or what have you. But Christians, which means followers of Christ, followers of Messiah, we must not base anyone's values or base anyone's worth according to the values of this world. We've also, according to 2 Corinthians 5, been entrusted with a ministry. We've been given a ministry called the Ministry of Reconciliation, and we are called ambassadors for Messiah. And that entails that we appeal to the world to be reconciled to God. This ministry of reconciliation includes, quote, not counting their trespasses against them. In other words, we are to live a life of radical forgiveness just as we have been radically forgiven. Okay, so hopefully I haven't lost you, but with that framework in mind, let's go ahead and, and get into the book of John here. Uh, we're going to be talking about Yeshua's encounter with the Samaritan woman. This is a story that we're all familiar with. It's a very simple and straightforward story, and yet the story is very profound. And I think that it gives us a model for how to walk out this new creation and how we are to be ministers of reconciliation. This story, I think, is also written for our benefit. As John himself says toward the end of his gospel, he says, these stories are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. So this is John's objective. The author of the Gospel of John, his objective for writing this story is so that we will believe in Yeshua the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing in him, we may have life in his name. So with that in mind, let's begin in John chapter 4, starting in verse 1. 
Now, when Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus was making and baptizing more disciples than John, although Jesus himself did not baptize, but only his disciples, he left Judea and departed again for Galilee, and he had to pass through Samaria. Okay, so what's going on here? Uh, Yeshua and his disciples, they're baptizing, and the Pharisees hear about it, and so they're like, all right, well, let's get out of here. And so they leave the Judean countryside, and they travel to Galilee, which means that they had to cross through Samaria. Okay, so why is that a big deal? Well, what is Samaria? Samaria, it was the capital of the northern kingdom of Israel, as we learn in, in 1 Kings 16.24. And this northern kingdom of Israel, they were taken into exile by Assyria. And then scripture talks about how foreigners had begun settling in the land and they began mixing with the remaining inhabitants in the land. And these foreigners, they brought along with them their gods, they brought along with them their uh, idolatry and false beliefs of their cultures, their religions, and these false ideas began mixing with the beliefs concerning the God of Israel because these were remaining inhabitants in the, in the region, they believed in the God of Israel, so there was mixture there between these different philosophies and religions and beliefs. And this is where we get the Samaritans. The Samaritan people developed from that. And so they were a people who believed in the God of Jacob, but their theology concerning the God of Jacob was completely distorted, completely messed up. They even had their own version of the Torah or the, the Pentateuch, Genesis through, through Deuteronomy. It, they had their own version of it, meaning that there was like discrepancies between their version of the Torah and ours. And so because of these things, the Jews and the Samaritans did not like each other. And uh, Josephus, he gives us uh, a little bit more insight here. In his Antiquities of the Jews, he tells us that uh, the Samaritans, they insisted that Mount Gerizim was the proper place of, for the temple. So unlike the Jewish people, and, and as our scriptures testify, that the place that God placed his name was in Jerusalem, and that was where the temple was to be built, the Samaritans disagreed with that. They said, no, Mount Gerizim is the proper place for the temple where God had placed his name. We also learn that they were banned from the Jerusalem temple. So the Samaritans were not allowed to worship God at the Jerusalem temple. And actually, there's an interesting story that Josephus records for us about why that was the case in a 1 AD uh, a group of Samaritans had apparently went to a nearby graveyard and dug up some corpses and they snuck into the Jerusalem temple and started laying corpses all around the Jerusalem temple, defiling the temple. And so because of that, they were actually banned from the Jerusalem temple. And we also read from Josephus that uh, the Samaritans would sometimes get into violent conflicts with the Jews. So whenever the Jewish people would be traveling through that region, the Samaritans would also often heckle them, and these encounters would often turn violent. So this gives us a little bit more context, I think, into these first century conflicts and relationships. It was pretty intense, right? Jews did not like the Samaritans. They had messed up theology and they weren't very nice. So how many of you know people who have weird beliefs and they aren't very nice? You're likely friends with many of them on Facebook or you interact with them on Facebook. So maybe in a small way you can understand the tension here. Hopefully none of those people lay corpses like on your church's front porch or anything. I would recommend calling the cops if you ever see anything like that. Uh, but in a small way, we can... We, we understand this, all right? You know, that there's, there's tension here between these groups. All right, so let's continue reading here. Verse 5. So he came to a town of Samaria called Sychar, which is most likely uh, modern-day Shechem. 
near the field that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there. So Jesus, wearied as he was from his journey, was sitting beside the well. It was about the sixth hour. A woman from Samaria came to draw water. Yeshua said to her, give me a drink, for his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. All right, so this is a very unusual situation. Yeshua, he's by himself beside this well. And then this woman comes by herself and, and he speaks to her. And typically, when women would come to draw water in this culture, they wouldn't come alone. They would come in groups. And yet this woman was alone, which would seem to suggest that she was an outcast, all right, and, and we'll learn a little bit later that she was. She was an outcast, and she was not really welcome. Not only is she an outcast be among Jewish people because she's a Samaritan, but this would seem to imply that she was an outcast even among her own community. All right, verse 9, the Samaritan woman said to him, how is it that you, a Jew, Ask for a drink from me, a woman of Samaria, for Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. All right, so she's shocked that this Jewish rabbi would even speak to her. Why? What are you doing? Like, why are you even speaking to me right now? I'm a Samaritan. So Yeshua is breaking all kinds of rules here, isn't he? He's breaking all kinds of, of social rules, cultural rules. First, the fact that he's talking to a woman who is not his relative is shocking enough because men did not have uh, long conversations with women in public unless they were their relative. So that's already shocking enough. And John is, you know, building up the, the, the tension here and he's building up the story. Uh, we are meant to be shocked by this. But furthermore, she's a Samaritan. She's a Samaritan. And so we are, are already explained the, the conflict that existed between Jews and the Samaritans. And she's a Samaritan woman, according to, actually, there is a, there's an old Jewish tradition uh, that existed in that time, or a viewpoint, I guess I should say, where Samaritan women were seen as continually unclean. And so in the Torah, you have the, the laws of Nadah, right, where uh, when a woman was on her monthly cycle, she was considered ritually impure, and therefore she was not allowed to go to the, uh, the temple or participate in the tabernacle or temple services uh, until she was, uh, re, you know, returned to a state of ritual purity. Well, from an ancient Jewish perspective, this is how much they, they didn't like the Samaritans. They viewed the Samaritan women as continually ritually impure, 24-7. They were ritually impure. You can never touch a Samaritan woman, and certainly you can never drink from a Samaritan woman's water jug, or else you would become ritually impure. It's not in the Torah, obviously, that says that, but this was a cultural uh, custom or a cultural idea. So the fact that Yeshua asks for a drink from this woman is, is incredibly significant considering the cultural context. All right, let's continue. Verse 10, Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God, and who it is that is saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw water with, and the well is deep. How do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob? He gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did his sons and his livestock. Verse 13, Yeshua said to her, everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, sir, give me this water so that I will not be thirsty or have to come here to draw water. So what's going on here? Yeshua, he is using our natural desire to satisfy our physical thirst, and he's using that as a symbol or a picture 
of our spiritual longing, our spiritual longing that everyone has. And, and there's kind of some confusion here in this discussion. It's the same kind of confusion that existed, uh, th that you see with Nicodemus in the previous chapter. Yeshua, he's talking about spiritual things. He's talking about looking beyond the physical to the higher, the spiritual truth. And Nicodemus and the Samaritan woman keep wanting to focus, they're, they're distracted by the physical. They're distracted by physical thirst or a physical temple, as we'll see later on. Yeshua wants this woman to know that he understands her troubles much more fully than she thought. He was aware of a deeper pain, a deeper suffering in her soul, a deeper longing, a deeper thirst. And so he offers her the solution to that inward spiritual longing. And he, he says that he will give her living water, which as we learn later in the Gospel of John, in John chapter seven, that's interpreted for us as the Holy Spirit. So Yeshua is talking about the Holy Spirit here. Many times throughout the scriptures, our, our spiritual inward longing for God is compared to thirst. Psalm 42 talks about how it says, as a deer pants for flowing streams, so my soul pants for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? Yeshua promises to satisfy this longing that we have. He promises to satisfy our emptiness. He promises to satisfy our thirst for something more than what this world can offer us. But what's interesting here is that he doesn't promise to only satisfy our thirst. He says, the water that I will give will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. So in addition to satisfying this desire that we have, Yeshua creates within us a life-giving spring of water. He creates within us. We become a new creation. And that we spring forth water, living water that will go out and affect others. What's interesting about this imagery of living water is that Yeshua wasn't just making this up out of nowhere. It wasn't just a neat idea or a neat analogy that he came up with out of nowhere. He's referring to the Hebrew scriptures. He's referring to prophecies that we read about in the Hebrew scriptures, specifically with regard to the temple of God, which will become very relevant in the story. Ezekiel 47, remember Ezekiel, he, he's a priest, he's, he's in exile, he's writing uh, you know, these, these prophecies about how God, he's going to bring the people back, and he describes that this future temple is going to be rebuilt, and there's going to be a river of life that flows from this temple, causing the desert region to flourish and become a place of life and healing. Well, throughout John, Yeshua is portrayed as that eschatological temple. Yeshua is portrayed as the true temple of God, and it's from him that the river of life would flow, bringing life and healing to the desert region. And what's interesting about this is that Yeshua also said that whoever believes in him will be joined to him. In John 7, 38, it says, whoever, or, yeah, John 7, 38, whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Now this he said about the spirit whom those who believed in him were to receive. Therefore, through Yeshua, all of us who believe in him, who become part of the body of Messiah, we become part of that eschatological temple of God from which the living water flows and brings healing and life. All right, verse 16. 
Jesus said to her, go, call your husband and come here. The woman answered him, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, you are right in saying, I have no husband. For you have had five husbands, and the one you now have is not your husband. What you have said is true. All right, so this woman's probably freaking out by now. Because from her perspective, who the heck is this Jewish rabbi, and why the heck is he talking to me to begin with? He doesn't know me. I've never met him before. And now he's pointing out things about my life that he should have no clue about. What is going on here? By the way, in this culture, pretty much everyone would look negatively upon this woman's situation. Everyone would all assume that she was totally messed up, that she must have done something really wrong to lose five husbands. And the fact that she's living with a guy who's not her husband is even worse. Completely immoral woman. And, and, you know, we're not meant to ignore that fact. Yeah, she is a completely immoral woman. Living in uh, immorality, she's a complete outcast. And yet, our Messiah takes the time to minister to her. Verse 19, the woman said to him, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, but you say that in Jerusalem is the place where people ought to worship. So again, she's focused on the physical while Yeshua is trying to point her toward the deeper spiritual truth. So this is a theological dilemma, though. This is a theological dilemma for this this woman because she recognizes that Yeshua is a prophet. That's what she said. I I perceive that you're a prophet. But that that doesn't uh, mesh well with Samaritan theology because Samaritans didn't believe that there were prophets after Moses until until a final prophet would come, according to their interpretation of Deuteronomy 18. So, Either she sees Yeshua as this final prophet, or more likely, she's beginning to question her religion. She's been beginning to question what she knew and what she grew up with and what she thought. In either case, she has a dilemma, though. Why? Because Yeshua is a Jewish rabbi. And she acknowledges that this Jewish rabbi is legit that he's the real deal, which would therefore entail that Judaism must be right about the location of the temple. They must be right that we're to worship God in Jerusalem. But that's a problem, isn't it? It's a problem for her because as a Samaritan, she's banned from the temple and thus she can't worship God in Jerusalem. How is she going to worship God? She's wondering, how am I going to worship God? I recognize that you're the real deal. I recognize that that you're a prophet. I acknowledge that. But, But you're Jewish. How do I worship God? Yeshua gives the answer to her dilemma. In verse 21, he says, Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me. The hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know. For salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship him. Verse 24, God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming, he who is called Christ. When he comes, he will tell us all things. Yeshua said to her, I who speak to you am he. So he reveals to this woman that he is the Messiah. 
The passage goes on to say that the woman, she, she was ecstatic. She was excited. She ran to town, and she told everyone what had happened. This guy, this Jewish rabbi, he told me things about my life that he shouldn't have known. He's the Messiah. And it, the text says that many Samaritans came to believe in Yeshua. Many Samaritans came to receive Yeshua because of this woman's testimony. And it even goes further. It says that he and his disciples stayed with the Samaritans for two days, teaching them, discipling them. Revival was going on in the Samaritan community. And it's a beautiful story, I think, that, that illustrates Messiah's heart for the marginalized, Messiah's heart for the oppressed, Messiah's heart for the rejected. Think of the significance here. It was to this broken woman, this immoral woman, an outcast, a sinner, shunned by the religious elite, shunned by her own community. Yeshua declares to this woman her, his identity. Yeshua met her where she was, in her sin, in her brokenness, and he gives her hope and delivers her. It would have been highly unlikely for, for any other rabbi or religious Jew of that day to minister to this woman the way that Yeshua did because of the cultural baggage. Think about that. And the, that Samaritan community, all those people that came to receive Yeshua, that wouldn't have happened if no one would have ministered to her. Yeshua went out of his way. He, he met her where she was and in her where she was and, and ministered to her. Yeshua is calling us to cross man-made cultural boundaries. Yeshua is calling us to go against the grain. We're not called to conform to the culture. We're not even called to conform to the religious culture. We're called to conform to the unchanging standard of God's word, which is fully realized in Yeshua the Messiah as our example. How many of you guys know uh, Billy Graham? Of course you do. He's a, great, uh, he's a great Christian man. He passed away recently. And there's this story about him that I, I really love. He was involved in the civil rights movement. And in the early 1950s, during one of his crusades, he was on stage, and uh, it was in the South, and there was segregation between whites and blacks. And at this place that they were at, they actually had physical ropes that they put up to separate whites from blacks. And so Billy Graham, he's on stage, and he tells the ushers to take down the ropes. Take down those ropes right now. Yeshua, he tore down the middle wall of partition. There is no Jew or Greek. There is no slave or free. There is no man or woman. We are all one in the Messiah, Yeshua. Take down those ropes. And the usher refused to take down the ropes. So he got off the stage and took down the ropes himself. And I got, you know, we, we look back at that now, you know, and man, like, think about it. Think about that in that cultural context. A lot of folks would not have been happy about that, what Billy Graham did. What he did took courage. Yeshua is calling us to have that courage. Yeshua is calling us to break down those man-made boundaries that, man, that, that, are, uh, that divide his people, that keep us from ministering to those who need him. What man-made boundaries are Yeshua calling you to cross? Are you willing to reach out to even the people that hate you? 
Are you, are you willing to reach out to the immoral people? It's much easier to complain about the Samaritans on Facebook than it is to actually engage them. Ask me how I, I know that, by the way. Because uh, if there's one thing I'm good at, it's pointing out everything that is wrong in the world. <laughs> and I'm not saying that there's anything wrong with speaking truth. I'm not saying that there's anything wrong with uh, proclaiming truth and standing up for what's right, standing up against injustice. God forbid, we're commanded to. We're commanded to stand up for righteousness and what's right. But in the midst of our stand for righteousness, there's a temptation, I think, to count those on the other side, quote unquote, as a lost cause. I think that there's a temptation to become tribal. And we don't engage, we don't try to understand or to empathize. We just stand at a distance and throw our stones. And thus, our ministry of reconciliation isn't really a ministry of reconciliation at all. One of the greatest injustices today, in my opinion, is abortion the slaughter of innocent babies in the womb. And I'm not trying to get political. I I think it's a shame that this issue has become a political issue because it's not. It's a moral issue. It's an issue that transcends politics. I don't care about political parties. Political parties are temporary. They're not going to last. They're going to pass away. Yeshua's kingdom is eternal. But this is an issue of justice. And I think it's our moral duty to be the voice of these babies, these children. Yeshua told us to be concerned about the least of these. And I'm all for that. I will shout it from the rooftops. But there's another group that I think sometimes gets lost in all of our debates. And I think that's uh, the women struggling with that choice. Many who are scared, many who are, are vulnerable, who are hurting, who don't have any kind of support, who don't know what to do. They're victims of abortion too. There's an organization, I had some friends involved in this organization in St. Louis. Uh, They actually, one of the primary aspects of their ministry is ministering to these women, what they call uh, abortion-determined women. Women that are are basically, they're determined to go and get an abortion. And they'll actually park outside of Planned Parenthood and they will engage these women and talk to them and pray with them and love them and offer them resources. They, they say, we can give you a free ultrasound, for example. And they give them resources and they actually talk to them and, and they've actually been successful in convincing these women to choose life. Many of these women. They have actually been successful in convincing them to choose life and and to choose adoption or any other uh, resource or or, or option. And um, they'll actually help these women. They'll give them what they need. They'll they'll set them up with support groups. They'll, uh, They'll take care of them. So stand for truth, yes. Absolutely, I'm, I'm right there with you guys. I will proclaim the truth until the day I die. All right, well, I want to unpack those last few verses we read in John because I think there's a lot here. I think there's a lot here. Yeshua said, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. 
what the heck is he talking about? He says not only uh, are the Samaritans wrong, but it's not even on that mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. So here Yeshua answers this woman's dilemma because remember, she's a Samaritan. She comes to understand that this Jewish rabbi is the real deal. And therefore, she, she feels like she can't worship God because she's banned from the Jerusalem temple. So here Yeshua answers her dilemma by pointing to the deeper spiritual reality. She's focused on the external form of religion. Yeshua says that true worship transcends that. True worship transcends that. Now, just to make sure you don't misunderstand me, that does not negate the importance of the temple. It does not negate the importance of Jerusalem. Yeshua says in the very next verse that the Jews are right. He says, we worship what we know, you worship what you don't know. And we know that the apostles, even after Yeshua's resurrection, the apostles even participated in the temple service. So there's nothing wrong with the temple. Yeshua is not repudiating the temple service. He's not repudiating outward religious expression. What he's doing is he's uncovering the deeper heart of worship that God desires from us. Because the physical temple is merely a symbol of the reality in Messiah, or as the author of Hebrews puts it, it's the shadow that points to the reality. God wants his presence to fill the whole earth through us. True worship of God is not restricted to the physical temple in Jerusalem. And so in pointing to this deeper spiritual reality, Yeshua solves her dilemma. She's not excluded from worship of God. I'll make one more point on that. Um, the temple was not the problem. It was the abuse of the temple that was the problem. Because remember, in the prophets, Isaiah 56 specifically, um, the God of uh, Israel says that he wants the foreigners to come and draw near to him and that his house of prayer would be, or that the Jerusalem temple would be a house of prayer for all peoples. So it was man's abuse of religion that was the problem, not the temple or, or, or anything like that. It's the same thing that you have in Galatians when uh, it seems like Paul is, is talking bad about the law. No, he's not talking about the, the law as a bad thing. He's talking about the abuse of the law, the misuse of the law, which is uh, creating bondage for people. All right, Yeshua also says that God is spirit and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. Okay, so this is pretty important. Wouldn't you agree? As it says that the Father is looking for only one type of worshiper, and if we consider ourselves worshipers of God, we better make sure that we know what that means. Are you a true worshiper? So first, what is worship? Well, there are a number of Greek words that are translated as worship. Uh, the word used here is proskuneo, and in Greek, it means to deeply respect or do reverence to. And uh, the most free, it's the most frequent word rendered to worship, and it's used of an act of homage or reverence, according to Vine's Expository Dictionary. Okay, so again, Yeshua is saying that worshiping God is something that can be done outside of the temple service. It's not restricted to the temple service. It's not restricted to outward religious expression, which therefore implies that worship is much more than a temple service. Worship is much more than a church service or a synagogue service or any kind of service. Again, there's not anything wrong with that. But the type of worship that God wants from us is deeper than once a week at Sabbath service. Worship is an, an inward sense of reverence and awe that is then expressed in every aspect of our lives. 
in every aspect of our lives. One of those ways that worship is expressed is through outward religious practice or tradition. And I don't wanna take away from that. I wrote a whole book on it. But the problem is that when we focus only on the outward expression of worship, it's not true worship. When we focus only on the outward expression of worship, it's not true worship. There are plenty of people that come to church service and they go through the motions, and they're not real worshipers. They'll sing along with the worship band, they'll maybe lift their hands, but they're not really worshiping. You know what God says about such worship? About those who just go through the motions? About those who just bring an offering to the temple, and they celebrate the feast days, but they're, they're neglecting the poor? Their heart's not really in it. They're not really sincere. What does he say about that kind of worship? He says it's an abomination. Your feasts are an abomination to me. Such worship is a joke, according to God. It's, it's utterly pointless. James says that true religion is to visit the widow and the orphan in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained from the world. So this is something that we need to figure out. Are you a true worshiper? Or do you simply have an appearance of godliness while denying its power? Do you turn up your nose towards the poor, the marginalized and the oppressed? Because that's connected to true worship. That's connected to true religion. That was one of the problems that the prophets identified when they rebuked Israel for their fake worship. So here's a question that some people might ask. But what if I, I simply don't desire God? What if I have no inward sense of awe and reverence for him? How can I become a true worshiper? Well, my first answer to that question is to disagree with you. I think that you do have a longing in your heart to know God, because I think everyone does. The problem is that you don't see God as the one who is able to satisfy that longing. You're focused on the physical rather than the spiritual. You're under the delusion that something else will bring you fulfillment, something else will satisfy that longing within you, will fill that void within you, so you pursue everything else, not realizing that what you're truly longing for is God's presence in your life. What you're truly longing for is the Holy Spirit to take hold of you. God gave you that longing so that you will find fulfillment in him. And that leads me to my second answer to this question, which is to go to Yeshua. Go to Yeshua. Yeshua says that he is the source of the living water. Ultimately, I don't think that a, a true heart of worship is something that we can muster up on our own. I think that it, it's a supernatural act of God. But we have to open up our hearts to receive it. We have to drink of that living water. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. He will meet you in your immorality. He will meet you in the depths of your depravity and your sin. He will meet you there. He will pull you out of that. He will give you new life, new purpose, new identity. He will create within you a spring of water welling up. He'll satisfy you. Another question that people ask is, what does it mean to worship God in spirit and in truth? Because that's what true worship is defined as. So according to the commentaries that I've read, um, 
And this basically means to, that true worship engages both the head and the heart. And it must be done in accordance with the revealed truth of God and with your entire being, with your passion and your emotion and your affection. I think John Piper, uh, one of my favorite Christian teachers, sums it up pretty well in his book, Desiring God. He says, worship must be vital and real in the heart, and worship must rest on a true perception of God. There must be spirit and there must be truth. Truth without emotion produces dead orthodoxy and a church full or half full of artificial admirers. On the other hand, emotion without truth produces empty frenzy and cultivates shallow people who refuse the discipline of rigorous thought. But true worship comes from people who are deeply emotional and who love deep and sound doctrine, strong affections for God rooted in truth are the bone and marrow of biblical worship. Going back to the, the story of the Samaritan woman, Yeshua said that we Jews, we worship what we know. So he's not discounting truth. He's not compromising the truth in ministering to this woman. So true worship must include sound theology and emotional affection. To, to use an analogy, my wife, she's at... She's at home right now, um, but after service, if I give her a call and I'm just very affectionate to her and I say, baby, I can't wait to just come home and to stare into your beautiful blue eyes and run my fingers through your blonde hair. Well, those of you who know my wife uh, would know that she would probably hang up on me if I said that. <laughs> Why? because my wife doesn't have blue eyes and blonde hair. <laughs> she has brown eyes and she has auburn burn hair, so she's not going to say, oh, that's so sweet. I understand your heart. That's okay. It's, it's all right that you didn't know I, I don't have blonde hair and blue eyes. <laughs> so having, having correct doctor and correct theology on the basis of Messiah through which truth is fully realized, having correct doctrine leads to having correct affection. Spiritual depth must include our mind. It must include learning truth. It must include growing in the Word of God. However, we must also experience it. It does no good to simply know the truth if we don't walk in it. This goes back to worship. And by the way, worship team, uh, you guys can come back up if you can, or a couple of you. It does no good to simply know the truth if we don't walk in it. We have to experience it. You can know all about solar eclipses, for example, but there's something about experiencing a solar eclipse, having that excitement and that feeling in your stomach as you look up at one. Uh, there is a, I know there's a lunar eclipse recently, but a while back there was a total solar eclipse. Do you guys remember that? That came through, and that was awesome. And I remember my wife and I, we were really excited about seeing it because we were going to be able to go to this park and get a really good look at it. And beforehand, like a couple of days beforehand, we're talking about this eclipse and we're just learning all of these interesting facts about this solar eclipse. And that was great and that was exciting and that was fun, but it was all the more when we actually saw it, when we actually experienced it, and we had that deep sense of awe that what we were just witnessing was as profound. The, it got darker, it got colder, I, I got shivers, you know, and, and it, was, it was just a really neat experience. And so I think that we, it's not enough just to know about God, we must know God. We must engage with him on a deeper emotional level. So how do we get there? I believe it begins with receiving the living water. It begins with Yeshua. If 
you guys want to pray with me? Heavenly Father, uh, we are just so grateful for who you are. We are just so grateful that you meet us in the, the depths of our sin, our confusion, our messed up beliefs, that you crossed those boundaries for us. God, that, that you became man you lived among us. You cared for us. You empathized with us. You died for us. You understood our pain, our struggles. You understand, God. Father, I just pray that if there's anyone here that doesn't know you, that has yet to receive that living water. God, I, I just pray for that person right now, those people. Father, I pray that you would speak to them, that your presence, God, would just overwhelm them in this moment. I pray that your Holy Spirit would impact them, that they would leave this place changed. God, that all of us would leave this place changed, that we would be empowered, Lord, to live out your new creation. We would be empowered, Lord, to minister to the people that need you, that we would cross those man-made restrictions and boundaries that are against that are against your mission, Lord. We, f we love you, Lord. We praise you. We thank you. We pray all these things in your Son, Yeshua's name. Amen. Shalom. I'm Matthew Vandrells, and I hope you enjoyed this message. Founded in Truth exists to cultivate a fellowship of image bearers that live the redeemed life only Yeshua can give. If this ministry has been a blessing to you, we would love to hear from you. Send us an email through the contact form on our website and tell us how God has used this ministry to edify your faith and relationship with Him. If you'd like to see more messages like this one, subscribe to our YouTube channel by clicking here. If you'd like to donate to this ministry and be a part of what God is doing through it, you can donate through our online giving portal here. We thank you for your continued support, and we look forward to next time. Shalom.